All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 1455 Summerfest. My name is Priyanka Champaneri. I am so pleased to be joined today by Jackie Paulzine and Linda Ray Fung. Um, the three of us actually have quite a bit in common. We all had debut novels that came out last year in 2021. Um, Jackie's is Brood. Linda's is Swimming Back to Trout River. And mine is the city of good death. Um, all three of us were finalists for the 2021 Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. And all three of our novels revolve around the themes of grief, memory, and wonder. And that's why we're all here today to have a discussion about our writing process and how we just, the things that we talked about in our books revolving around those themes. So Linda and Jackie, thank you so much for being here with me today. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and dive right in to my first question. We're gonna do this round robin style. Um, and I wanna talk about grief. So I know a real, a real upper <laughs> to start the conversation off. But I was so, so struck when I was reading both of your novels, how grief is really just kind of enmeshed in the core of both of these books. It really seems to be at the heart of, the, of each book, but it's also, you're also both playing with it in different ways in terms of these like underlying and overlying strands of grief. So grief in big ways and small the small disappointments that these characters experiment experience in their everyday lives, but also really larger griefs in terms of things that happened in their past that are still anchoring them down and preventing them from moving forward, or future, the possibility of future grief that affects the decisions that they make when they're moving forward. So I'm really curious to hear from both of you in terms of your process, whether you came at writing your books intentionally knowing that you wanted to explore grief or whether it was something that kind of revealed itself and it asserted itself as you were progressing with the writing. And really quick for myself, I will say I'm a very organic writer. So for me, I didn't realize I was writing about grief until I finished that first draft and read the pages and was like, oh, oh goodness, that's what's going on. So I'd really love to hear from both of you about how it was for you. Jackie, would you like to? <laughs> yeah, I can start out. So I think also I just kind of am an intuitive or um, kind of organic writer in that I don't outline very much. I mean, maybe that'll change because there's a lot of people um, hitting hard on the outline idea, but I don't know that it will become my process really to outline stuff. And so my the way the book started, I had been reading some fiction that was really close to life, delved a lot into like the details of the everyday. And I loved reading that kind of stuff. And I wanted, I had chickens for a few years and I thought, here's something that's a daily task, like something I could explore in, in detail. Um, so I hadn't really conceived of an idea yet, but I thought like, attention to the everyday was in my mind as something I wanted to do, which sounds kind of ridiculous because I mean, that's obviously a part of, of writing is like noticing detail. But I went out to the chickens one day and we had a broody hen and she was sitting on an egg as if it was going to hatch. A broody hen just thinks the egg is fertilized when it's not. There's no rooster. So in our case, we didn't have a rooster. The egg couldn't be fertilized. And yet the hen was treating the egg as if it was because hens will otherwise take on this behavior that's less, um, they'll just walk away from the egg. And she was totally attached to the egg. And so I saw this chicken um, like waiting for this thing to happen that was never gonna happen. Like um, this egg to yield a chicken. And she, she reminded me so much of myself because I was struggling with infertility at the time. And I just felt like, ooh, this is, like that connection felt worth exploring and that's how it started. But very quickly I realized, um, having also had a miscarriage that what I was really exploring were feelings of grief and that this was the mode. But, but yeah, like when I noticed, I should say quickly I determined it was a mode of exploration, but the grief aspect of it wasn't super obvious to me right away. I mean, it, it would seem maybe these things because a book seems like a realized thing. 
Um, but yes, it took a while to realize that was the story. I love, I love the, the, the phrase, the booty hen. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll, 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 I, I concur with both of you that I'm, I'm also not an outline uh, sort of blueprint kind of person. Um, I, um, I think for me, um, writing fiction is always tangled up with uh, thinking about childhood of some some nature or another, my own childhood, other people's childhood, kind of like the universal childhood. <laughs> um, and so I, 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 it was, you know, I never thought about it, but, um, you know, every, every story I started, every kind of like snippets of uh, inspiration I had when I was just starting out to write, um, always, uh, you know, brought me to something that touched on someone's childhood, if not mine. And one of the things I thought about uh, was one of the most exciting things in childhood is being let in on a secret in the adult world like when you know when you've discovered adults had secret and they're saying keep it you know keep it that way it was the most exciting thing for a child for me um and 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 so really for me the 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 uh, fiction and like of any scale um, kind of starts with the things that people don't tell each other, uh, whether it's a family not telling something to um, younger children, uh, you know, you know, of, of various for various reasons, things that spouses keep from each other, uh, things parents keep from, you know, children keep from their parents and from their elders. Um, they're 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 exciting and tantalizing in a lot of ways. And it's only after you probe the surface of secrets and why you keep them, why it's unspeakable, um, that that you st that I felt that I started to get at the grief. And so that's also another really exciting thing about writing fiction is that you start out thinking, oh, I'm gonna write about secrets um, or, or the exciting discovery of secrets uh, for a child. And then you probe and you probe and you get to the bedrock of something and then it becomes loss and grief and things that you cannot speak even to yourself. Um, so for me, that was how, um, the kernel of my story started so um and it's very messy so i i i, I will uh say that too it's really heartening to hear that we're all organic writers because i'll i'll read interviews or hear from other writers who outline everything and i'll just think to myself what's wrong with me like why can i not have a plan why can't i because it, for me, it feels like it just takes so long and it just feels like, you know, Shawshank Redemption digging a tunnel out with the spoon and I don't know where I'm going and I got to turn back and, you know, it, it's, it's so fraught. But like Linda, as you said, it's that discovery. It's also so, so exciting. So it's really, really great to hear that we're all similar in that way. Yeah, for me, it's more like, you know, I'm at the edge of a chasm and I'm like trying to find the pieces of wood that I will nail to, <laughs> to something so that I can climb over or step over. Yeah. And it's about as organized as that. So. Yeah. All these escape metaphors. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, I love the idea of starting with a secret as like a writing, not like just a prompt, but like as a generative exercise, it feels really useful. Yeah, exactly. And this idea that I feel like all, all books that are like propulsive in some manner, there is a mystery at the heart of it. And what better yeah. mystery than the secret, right? Like yeah. finding out what that, what that secret is. And definitely that felt true for both of your books. There was some sort of little mini mystery kernel at the heart of it. And you're trying to find out what's going on with these characters, like what's driving them and what are they hiding? And same for you, Priyanka, because that, you know, your book starts with a giant secret. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's funny to be even in, like included in this idea of how a story comes into being because Brood is such a simple, it really is a very simple construct, but even that didn't, it's, it's like a whole lot of not knowing to arrive at something even that simple, when I extrapolate out to the complexity of your stories, the cast of characters with all of their histories and motives and secrets and all of that, it feels like mind blowing <laughs> to contemplate. I would need like 
a very disastrous metaphor to <laughs> approach that task. <laughs> And yet, you know, what's fascinating to me is that, you know, we wrote very, very different books of very, very different lengths and very, very different topics in some ways. And yet they're all similar in how multi-layered they are. And I loved just seeing that and being just as a reader, just the experience of peeling back the layers. You know, when you pick up Brood, it seemingly seems like a very slim book. And, you know, it, you know, outwardly, it seems like one. But my goodness, the layers that are in there, just the layers upon layers. And I had to, I found myself I had to force myself to slow down because you have these incredible surface details about what this protagonist is doing on a day-to-day -day level, Jackie, but like deeper within there, there's all this stuff going on that you're going to miss if you just kind of flash by it. And Linda, I mean, the same with your book, just like, you know, the back and forth between time and between characters and just the magic of seeing how all those layers coalesce at the end. Oh, it's just beautiful. The two of them, fabulous. Well, I feel like that might be a, a good segue to, uh, <laughs> to, to my question, uh, which is that um, I, I love the fact that you, again, to echo what Priyanka just said, that you know, your two novels are so different. Um, but then I, I noticed myself admiring and really enjoying something that, that you had in common, which is um, the kind of what I think of as a creaturely and tangible materiality of to, to, to everything that you write. So the example that I'm thinking about is, you know, in Jackie, sort of the opening of Jackie's uh, novel, the, the temperature, the, the warmth of, uh, of an egg being put in someone's hand. And in Priyanka, you know, you, you had so many uh, examples where um, we have uh, the, the, the weight of a, the sound, the heft and the sound of a clay pot as, you know, it's being kind of clamored or, you know, dropped or being lifted out of a well and all of those things, um, you know, I, I, and I felt really transported to both of your worlds, whether it's a farmhouse in the middle of America or a holy city on the, on the edge of the Ganges River. And so my question to, uh, to you is that, um, the, how do you, uh, what do you do? Like, how, how do you make sure that the readers become immersed in the world that you're creating? Uh, you know, and, and, and how do you, you know, keep that tangibility and materiality of your world, um, you know, kind of keep, keep it going throughout your novels? Yeah. Do you want me to go first? Sure. Yeah, yeah Priyanka, you go. Um, I feel like the way you phrased it, Linda, it makes it seem like it's it's very intentional and it's definitely, it's not intentional and like one knows what exactly what one's doing. And in my case, one definitely did not know what one was doing at all. Um, I've never been to the city that I wrote about. I've been to India several times as a tourist, but never to that city. And as a reader or just somebody experiencing film or experiencing real life, I'm really drawn to those tangible things. Um, I'm really drawn to the object, to just maker culture and how things are made, process. Um, I remember as a kid when I would watch Mr. Rogers, my favorite segments were when he would go to factories and show you how things were made. So like crayons and erasers. And I just love the tangibility of like, how, what does an object start at? What does it end up as? And then all of the feeling around that is kind of inherent to it too. So I decided to write about the city that I had never been to. And it's an incredibly important and iconic city within Hinduism. And kind of my way of, I had to make myself believe it because I create, you know, I had a tremendous amount of inferiority feeling and that I had never been here. So what right did I have to write about the city? So I had to make myself believe it somehow that even though I hadn't walked those streets and even though I hadn't smelled all the scents in the air, that I had that I was there in my imagination. Because if I didn't believe it, then there was no way that the reader wasn't was going to believe it. And so I think the way I did it, for lack of a better word, the way I kind of faked that experience for myself was drawing on all of these other details that I had experienced or that I did know about from travels to India or just, you know, the fact that I grew up within an Indian household and just all kind of the accoutrements, those, those, 
those details of domesticity, which I really, really love, um, for whatever reason are things that I really pick up on and are just interesting to me. So, you know, when you kind of think of like, you know, the average traveler who goes to India, there are perhaps those stereotypical things that come to mind that, you know, they come back and tell stories about. What I'm interested in is the laundry hanging out of the window or the smell that was behind that alley or, you know, like how many animals were down on the gots, like, you know, and what, what color were the goats and just, you know, the stuff, all the stuff, like how many sandals were lying on the stone steps and what kind of cloth was the washer boy washing out? I'm so interested in that. And so it wasn't intentional on my part. I think it was more stuffing the book with stuff that I loved while also kind of inadvertently an effort to create a world when I didn't feel confident enough at the time when I started writing, um, I had to make myself believe it. I love, I love hearing maker culture, like fanaticism, <laughs> because really, I mean, there's, I wonder how true that is for writers across the board. I mean, I'm thinking, you know, it's different. It's a different kind of craft to like take stuff and make something of it, but yet that's kind of like a metaphor for what a writer's doing is like making something out of this stuff. <laughs> but yeah, Priyanka, I know the the spices, I mean, the food, the spices, the smells, the chai, and more chai and more chai. And more chai. I mean, I went into the grocery store and was like, I need chai. <laughs> Mission accomplished um, then, Jackie. It was like, it, it's almost like, it wasn't just like, that sounds good. It was more that I was feeling as if I could smell it. <laughs> it was sort of a presence, continual presence while reading your book. And yeah, the, I mean, the cloths, I can't, I bet I've envisioned 10 or more specific, like kind of, colors of saris and prints and embroidery just in the reading of your book. I mean, I, yeah, I, the details were so rich. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, one thing that I do think I believe in is that if you look at anything long enough, it will be interesting. And there's like a, there's some quotes, there's a couple of different quotes that like sort of say the same thing. Um, I think I remember being traced to Flaubert, but obviously it's like a kind of common sentiment of like, oh, well, if you pay attention to something, it becomes more interesting. And I think I questioned whether all along writing Brood, I, I took a break from it for a while for practical reasons. And when I returned to it, the question in my mind was, is this just for, like, am I just challenging myself to write something that no one will find interesting and no one will read? And there were, um, and I guess I, I just felt that way all along. Like it was a worthwhile challenge. And as the meaning accrued for me, I felt very committed to it. But as far as like, was that world gonna hold someone's attention? I never really knew. So I guess I tried to repeatedly um, challenge myself. To, like I can remember a scene where I felt like nothing's, there's nothing going on in this garden. I don't, is this, does this even need to be here? And I remember just saying like, find something in this, it's a garden, like make it interesting for yourself if nothing else. Like I felt very like frustrated with, my, with myself at that point that like a garden couldn't hold someone's interest. And I think that was just sort of the process was like bumping up against my own limitations very often, like the limitations of my own mind. And that felt like a worthwhile pursuit. Um, so I don't even, yeah, I think that book is um is a little challenging in that way um but one thing i do think is that in in all of our work there's humor at play i mean like quite a bit of humor if you think about the dire circumstances a lot of times and like a constant influx of like some levity i remember the first instance of death being like it's so funny because Pramesh is kind of like that buoyant feeling of a death in the hostel. It's just like, oh my, like the, I just loved that so much. 
because it really did allow me to think differently about death. I mean, continually, I, I allowed myself to think differently about the circumstances of death and how one might approach it. Um, so yeah, the humor, I think it served as like, well, um, the humor does some of that work too. Um, but I do, sometimes I wonder if I don't revert to humor as a sort of like, well, if you're not going to be interested in this, at least I'll give you a little, do you know what I mean? Like, it's almost like an, a, an um, concession or something where it's like, or a consolation for those who aren't yet interested. Here's a little humor. And it's, and it functions much more naturally than that. But I sometimes question the impulse of my own my own like comedic impulse if it isn't a little bit of like pandering or something I mean that's definitely taking like a strange view of things I think humor is essential as a um as a kind of therapy or like a re rejuvenating force and a state of mind so but I do like kind of I still like to interrogate it a little bit. Yeah. And Jackie, I will tell you when you're talking about humor, and I, and I was going to talk about this later too, when, when we just talk about wonder, but that scene with the raccoon in the alley and the suitcase, and you've basically, you've kind of personified him. I remember reading that and being like, if I could like frame a scene from a novel, I want to frame it. I loved it so much. And I think it's exactly the reason where you just come upon this, this scene and it seems it's the absurdity of it yeah, within the yeah. circumstance, which I absolutely loved. And in, 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 the, in a lot of ways, I think it reminds you that the writer and, and these people are people, right? So you can't be stuck in grief the whole time that there are other things, like the world is moving around you. And even though you're mired in deep grief, there could be a raccoon in an alley, like about to go on a trip <laughs> with this suitcase. Yeah, and Jackie, I'll just jump in here to say that there's so many times that I laughed out loud um, <laughs> when reading Brood. And um, I also say that, you know, thinking about attention and what it does when um, a, a writer trains her attention on an object, like I felt like, you know, you've written a page turning book about chickens. I mean, not just about chickens, but I, I was I held in thrall in so many um, uh, moments where I just felt like it was so suspenseful. You're talking about, you know, um, egg ducks or egg tunnel or, <laughs> and I'm just glued to the page. And I think this cannot get any more dramatic and suspenseful. <laughs> so, and that, I mean, that's funny because it, it, like even just hearing it as a conversation does sound kind of bizarro. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's so engrossing and you learn so much. Like I'm hope like you know like you just learn so much and for again I feel like as you you might have mentioned Jackie like you know a lot of writers with maker culture like I feel like a lot of writers are interested in process not just of writing but of other things too. So in that sense it's like a writer's delight to read brood because you're just learning all of these things. And really quick Linda I wanted to ask you in terms of like learning all of these things I was blown away while reading your book because I hadn't expected music to play such a big part of it just from reading the jacket copy and even just looking at the cover and with your question in terms of like writing about these these tangible feelings and objects I'm so curious about for you personally like was all of that musical knowledge something that you accrued over a lifetime or is that stuff that you had to learn for the book and I was really interested especially when you're talking about the various violins in the book. And at one point, you know, we, not to give away anything, but we're seeing the innards of a violin and kind of seeing like how a violin is constructed and the anatomy of a violin. And I was so transfixed by all of those details. Um, thank you. And I, I'm totally part, I, I love maker culture. <laughs> I mean, not to kind of butt in on uh, the answer Q&A part of this. Um, I, I love the idea of being able to see inside a violin. And um, 
and you know, to say nothing about being able to put one together from pieces of maple and spruce. And so I'm fascinated with that. Um, but for me, I'm, um, I, I played the violin for two years in high school and that was about the, that was the end of my career, <laughs> um, music career. And I've forgotten, I would say 90% of what I, uh, what I knew back then. Uh, but it it has continued to be um, an obsession, and I I I think about it as something that I don't I'm really not a part of. So I'm extreme extreme amateur, but trying to kind of peek into the you know the, you know, the, the little cracks in the blinds and kind of trying to you know see what's actually going on behind the uh, the curtain a little bit and. And I think as a novelist, that drive is actually quite energizing. And that's what gets me, um, you know, writing and, and, and getting through the tough, really the challenge of putting words to paper because I'm constantly speaking of wonderment. Um, I'm, I, I'm amazed about, um, by the intricacy, the materiality and, you know, the non-material aspect of music making and uh, music performance. So, yeah, but not to um, take away from, <laughs> uh, you know, the general uh, question. No, you're not. And I will say that even though you're calling yourself an amateur, you had me utterly convinced um throughout throughout the book um that might not be saying a lot because I have zero music knowledge but I mean I I thoroughly enjoyed that aspect of it because I could sense that there were links happening that I needed to go and brush up on my own knowledge so I was able to enjoy the book on one level but also be aware of another level that I was missing out on that I could access if I just educated myself a little bit and I'll say for both of your books, I, I, you know, as soon as I read them, I want to look up everything I can about the topics, about, about, about everything that you guys touched on in the novel. And so for readers who are, uh, you know, thinking about <laughs> picking up either of these novels, uh, you won't be disappointed. I spent a lot of last night looking at pictures of the earthquake that comes into, you know, it's peripheral, it's, it's peripheralness and it's context in the story. And it's certainly like a force in the story. And I, um, yeah, I felt, um, I'm sure I've heard of it, but that is such a like recurring tragedy that I think it's very easy to get just like, um, I was amazed by it as a cultural moment. Um, so my, I have a question that was actually like part of this question in a way. It's sort of about this, it's about the world building and how you do it. And maybe um, it was, a, it was sort of like, how do you, it's maybe very similar, but almost like how do you inhabit that mind? How do you get yourself in the state of mind that is the music the person who, for example, music is a calling and it's innate in their system. And Linda, you embody like many, many different characters and they all have different relationships to music, some more than others, but the musicality of the writing all throughout just like unifies their story. I mean, there's a sense that sound becomes, you become so aware of, of sound and, and music as it's presented through other senses as well, like a force in the body, a feeling in the body, what the visions it provokes in people. And it almost becomes like the landscape becomes the kind of music. It's just something about the state of mind you put the reader in, which is, and so I just wonder about how did you access that state of mind or create it? And then I have like a little change up on the question for Priyanka, but like, it's all like, how did you get the mindset of this world? Okay, so I'll start then. <laughs> um, so for me, the mindset is actually very natural because I love people who are obsessed. Um, I love people who are fanatics. And um, I, I, you know, it's a, it's like sort of a vicarious pleasure to, to write about or to find out about people who are deeply, deeply immersed in something, even if I am not, you know, like I, 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 I'll be lucky if I can re remember how to read music right at this moment, but I love to hear how 
uh, you know, what training feels like, what, what rehearsal feels like, what, um, you know, the, the, the uh, mental self-defeating mental habits of uh, performance anxiety could be, or, you know, what, what are the pains of, um, uh, you know, not having the right violin <laughs> or, you know, losing your violin or, or having your violin damaged, right? Um, and so I, you know, I, and, you know, I continued this path on, for every story I write, I'm, I'm currently obsessed with whales and so like the like the, the marine mammal um and i just i just chase it as far as i can so um i, I listen to recordings of music that i've I found productive and inspiring. Um, in my case, um, I listened to a lot of Nathan Milstein, who was this um, uh, performer who was a very, uh, who had a very clean sound. Um, and I, I would pick some, one of his um, pieces and kind of just kind of think about it and think about how I would describe it. Um, and then try to, I try to, uh, you know, with these ex, uh, obsessions, what I love is to see where these obsessions intersect with language, which is where I work, you know, the, the, the kind of thing that I kind of most intuitively understand and use that to a train light on something that I don't really understand as well. So uh, in this case, music or um, any other craft or art that's way beyond my abilities and, and my own experience. So kind of just, yeah, in, in this case, it's, it's the easy thing of just like sliding into that obsessive frame of mind, which is quite natural for me. What, do you ever slide so far, Linda, that you don't actually do any writing? Because you're just so much fun with the obsession yeah. part. Yeah, this is why it took me so long to finish this. And I feel like I'm still doing research on this novel in some ways. Like not, you know, obviously not for anything tangible, but, you know, when I come across a piece of um, writing or like, you know, a, an article that I think, uh, you know, I, I think, oh my God, I should have, I, sh I should have known about this <laughs> before I published the book, damn it. Um, and, and I keep thinking, well, you know, what, what can I do um, to make use of this? So yes, the rabbit hole is endless. It's infinite. The numbers and you know of rabbit holes and the depth to which they plunge. It's all, all very infinite. So what if you're like obsessed with whales? You're you have this idea, or maybe you don't know what the idea is yet, and you're obsessing and doing some note taking or writing, and then another obsession presents itself. Or so how? Um, is it hard to stay disciplined about like your current obsession or? Yeah, and I love to ask both of you the same question, of course. <laughs> um, it, it is, it is, it's, I, I, you know, th there's no question about it. I think that um, luckily, probably for, uh, for most of us, uh, when an idea, when obsession gets, uh, you know, grows legs uh, to a point that, you know, characters start to accrete and, and relationships and stories start to kind of come out of that obsession, um, they, they will have their own traction. And then other obsessions can come and go, but, uh, you know, the, the, the original, the, the characters and the stories can stay and, and, you know, gradually accrete. But I do tend to kind of get sidetracked. So, uh, this does not bode well for a quick uh, next novel. So, but anyways, I love that image, Linda, of just this creature growing legs. Like I'm picturing yeah. this giant centipede because I'd never thought of it before, but it's absolutely true, right? You know, they just, it's when the obsession kind of moves forward of its own accord. It's like grown so much in its mind that it just becomes its own thing. And I hadn't thought of it that way before, but now I will now. <laughs> Priyanka, does your obsession with the city of good death go on and on? You know, I, for me, I absolutely have obsessions and I absolutely have curiosities. Um, I can never think of it as research though, is the thing. The minute I tell myself I'm doing research, it just dies. It fizzles <laughs> out. Like my interest immediately fizzles out and dies. I don't know if it, because it feels like work or homework or too academic or, or what, but it doesn't somehow the word research doesn't entail the word fun and obsession and curiosity does entail the word fun. And 
fun is really key to, to everything I do because if it's not fun, then why bother? You know, like why spend so much time working on this thing and making yourself miserable? As we all know, you're definitely miserable while writing anything. Why even bother? So before I started writing this book, before I even knew I was going to start writing a book, it had grown out of this article that a friend had sent me, which turned out to be about the death hostels. And I had known about Benares for a very long time, but I'd never known about the death hostels. And that immediately just sent all the radar antenna up to be like, what is that? Like, these are real and how does it work? And who's allowed to stay there? And, you know, how long can you stay there? And what do they eat? And what happens when they die? And just question after question after question. And so that's where the obsession and the curiosity started. Well, what, what can I find? Let's read everything I can find on it. And in the strange way that either the universe aligns to give you everything that you need in that moment, or perhaps you're more attuned to noticing these things in the moment that you need them. I just started noticing all this material on Benares, just like plopping my way. So we got a magazine delivered to the house and there was a feature story on Benares. I was flipping through public television and there was a travel show on Benares. Like just all of these like, you know, just random seemingly coincidences about it. And I would just be there for all of them because I just wanted to know. I was accruing all of this knowledge, never thinking of it as accruing knowledge. And as Linda so aptly said, at some point, you know, going down the rabbit hole, it grew legs. It grew many, many legs. And all of these voices started popping up into my head. And only then was it starting to think about giving myself permission to write about it. Um, but in terms of like obsessions and curiosities and whether one should discipline them or just kind of go on, at this point, I kind of let myself just do whatever, or just follow whatever. I want to follow. And I trust that if it's something that's strong enough, I'll come back to it eventually. But I'm not somebody who writes every day. So I kind of have to like, I, I do self mediate and that like, if I have a project I'm working on, I try to at least think about it every single day. But if it's not happening, you know, sure, let's follow this other obsession over there. Or let's let's look at this thing or watch this movie or look at this book of photography or go, you know, research this plant or whatever because I really truly believe that everything is housed up there and it'll come back whenever you need it at whatever moment. Um, so there are like little details and well, not little details, but de details in the book about like, you know, farming, you know, Pramesh and Sagar, they come from a farming family. I didn't know anything about that. So, you know, put a tick mark in it and, oh, I, this has to be something that I go back and look up and, you know, pull from later on. Um, but just circling back again, never calling it research. Um, when I wanted to start working on something else, and I'm not really working on something else now, but when I was thinking about it, I had made a list of books for myself. And in my head, I was calling it research. And I should have known then that it was going to be dead in the water, because that's what I called it. It's just got to be this fun obsession that I'm interested in no matter what. Um, and then just have it manifest legs on its own. And yeah, it reminds me of the artist Sheila Hetty said something like the stakes have to be high enough in your writing to like keep your attention. Does that hold true for either of you or? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's the boredom factor, right? Like you can't, the minute you're bored, it's dead. Then, or, you know, for me, the minute it's not fun, then it's boring, then it's dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I also think of um, writing and, and the creative process as like a suitcase that I can use to hold all my obsessions. <laughs> so kind of, you know, like, you know, go to the farmer's market and you kind of get everything that you want, but ultimately you have to have a tote bag <laughs> to kind of take it home. Yeah. And, and there are moments when I was writing the novel when I felt like I was using the, using the novel as a way to kind of get at all the tiny obsessions that I had developed over my decades of life. And so probably, you know, I, I like, you know, not calling it research. It, it's like thinking about all the ways that you can showcase these rabbit holes that you fell into in, you know, 1999 or like 2015, um, then it becomes something interesting and then it doesn't feel like work anymore. So um, at least that's how I justify my various 
rabbit hole <laughs> of fumblings. Yeah. Um, but but I, I feel like I do um, remember things better when I can develop a narrative, a, a, a create a world to contain it. So, you know, instead of just looking up everything I know, I want to know about whales, um, you know, thinking of some way to contain that is actually itself a creative process. And it's a it sort of parallels writing or should be writing in some ways. And Linda, I only just now remembered there is a whale that makes an appearance <laughs> in your book. And so now I'm just thinking about it like, oh, is that where the obsession started? Or did you kind of put like an initial the obsession in there and now you're gonna follow it through later on? Yeah, no, I, I think like a lot of my obsessions can be traced back yeah. years years and years and then uh, you know and I think um you know when I when I when I think oh you know I don't want it to just be in a minor scene in my novel and maybe I want to do something else with it um in the, in the same with many other things and when I just when I read other people's work and I discover that they have done the same thing with uh you know their novel when I see elements of some uh, some some novelist's second book in their first book I always get so excited and I think oh, okay, I'm not the only one who wants to keep going with these tidbits. But yeah, um, they're, they're always like, it's a compost or, a, a, you know, it's all, it's all there, so. Yeah, no, I remember reading an essay by Ann Patchett where she's talking about like, I, she feels like all writers were essentially just writing the same story over and over again. And I wonder if obsessions fit into that. And she talks about herself as being the writer who a bunch of strangers get into a room or a crowded place and they got to deal with each other is the book that she's writing over and over again. And I, I suspect that I'm probably going to be no different in whatever I'm writing about. And I suspect that probably the two of you too, like, you know, those things are just going to crop up. And for one, I really like it when you see some like kind of echoes between writing, because it's almost like a different riff on it. You know, of course, of course there, I was talking to a writing friend where she was really getting a little scared about it. She's like, you know, she's written five books and she's like, you know, people are going to read this book and be like, it's just the same as the other five books. It's just the same thing over and over again. And I kept telling her, no, it's like, you know, cause you wrote it. So you know, all of those little, little similarities, but your reader's not going to know. They're just going to be swept up in the story and, and enjoy it. But so it is, it is funny to see those patterns. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is actually the thing I'm like most excited to talk about this whole conversation, which is memory. Um, speaking of obsessions, thinking about memory is one of my obsessions. I, I love seeing how writers deal with it within their work in different ways. And I feel like within our three books, I mean, it's certainly a testament to that. You know, Jackie, you have the book in some ways kind of hinging on this very, very visceral, important memory that we get pretty early on in the book. I don't think it's a spoiler alert to say it's, you know, when the character is recalling her very traumatic miscarriage, well, all miscarriage is traumatic. Um, and so we get very visceral detail of that. And then later on, I, I don't remember the, you know, the narrative alluding to it directly, but that specter of that memory is always kind of hanging over you know, the narrative very much like a ghost, like a specter. And Linda, I was so fascinated in yours because it appeared to me that, you know, you have these characters who are so desperate to hold on to memories because they're so important to their own personal story and how they see themselves, their identity. And yet the harder they hold on to it, it just slips out of their fingers, you know, ever quicker which was interesting to me because I felt like what I was trying to say and hopefully was saying, which is that when you're trying to suppress a memory and badly, badly wanting to forget it, it's just gonna come back with even more force and be more and more assertive. So I'd love for us to just talk about memory, um, what it means to both of you in terms of importance, whether it was something intentional that you were exploring, um, memory and its function in, us telling the story of our lives and characters telling the story of their lives, whatever you'd like to talk about associated with memory. Uh, I guess I do have, I did develop over the course of writing the book, a sort of um, goal, goal for myself or what was it? I don't, I don't know maybe how to describe it, but I began thinking of the chicken's memory as something to be um, 
sort of both very appealing to the narrator and almost like a form of enlightenment because they live in this like continually present sense. Um, like the only thing not really, chicken's not really having a memory and how if you're haunted by a memory, the idea of living without it, of just moving, of being in this moment with kind of the world in all its glory just kind of like available to you, but not having that weight of the memory, how that could be like a kind of enlightened state. And, and it's interesting, I mean, to think of chickens, to kind of give that quality to a chicken in any way. And it's not like chickens are in the book portrayed as enlightened beings necessarily, but they do not show signs of memory. And this is something that the narrator, um, notices and I think um, kind of covets for herself is this ability to be in this moment um, and then this, you know, like always in the present moment. So um, yeah, it's, it's interesting how the, it is the, the past as a haunting presence that provokes that yearning and and I think it's probably one that I myself yearn for a little bit is more being present in the moment. So it was fun to take on a kind of narrative challenge that was also a little bit of a personal challenge. And I think that probably is for me why um, this, that raised the stakes of the story for me is like, can I embody this in a narrative sense? Um, and it was fun to do it. It felt like, um, yeah, so memory as something to kind of grapple with and, and ultimately move through, I guess. So. Yeah, I'll jump in too. Um, so I, I grew up in a very large extended family. Um, and so I, I grew up being surrounded by storytellers and just very casual, like quotidian storytelling. Um, and I, I love the idea that memory could extend beyond our own generation and beyond our own years. And I, I love, it's so on one hand, so that's the wonder part for me. Um, I, I've experienced that I, I benefited from that tremendously. It's built my mind and it's, it's made me who I am. And on the other hand, I also, I have this constant anxiety about <laughs> not remembering or not, you know, you know, playing my own part in, 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 in ensuring this kind of intergenerational memory or interpersonal memory. Um, and so I'm constantly trying to make sure that I get things right. So there's like wonder and anxiety about memory. Um, and with, with a novel, uh, with Swimming Back to Trout River, I really wanted to um, get at this idea that um, a young person um, could one moment be very centered on, on her own world and just be very rooted in where she is in the present. But then the other moment, you know, the next moment be launched into this investigation to who her parents were, who her uh, grandparents are, and 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 who um, you know who who they you know did, did, like who are they beyond their relationship to her? And so it's kind of expanding one's, I guess, self perceptions through inheriting other people's memories too. And I love that process, and I think that's it's it's a very meaningful process and you know if there's like one thing that i can write about over and over again in all its uh, glory is is that that process of how everybody does it and what you know what what how, the frustrations and therefore the secrets um the, the sort of the ineffability about it and all the obstacles that that entails um the opposite of memory um and thinking about ways that our own attempts at it fail is also really interesting because I think about sometimes you know what, what we you know what we learn most about a process is when it breaks down and you know when something goes wrong and so yeah I think of memory as in, in those those sort of intergenerational terms yeah and how fallible our memory truly, truly is, um, which makes me just think of those chickens again, Jackie. I mean, they really do 
with memory is so fallible, it, it essentially is a flawed construct for us to build the story of our lives on. Um, maybe one we really should just be living in the present because the story we're telling ourselves is it, it has to be a lie or it has to be flawed in some sense. Certainly some parts could be true, but other parts, you know, everybody is remembering differently. I mean, this this reminds me of this the um, kind of the structure of the city of good death is this continually revising people's ideas about what they think they know and just like unearthing these layers of knowing. And it just, it's so illuminating, but it, it's kind of relentless. It's like the driving force of the book is just almost change, like slowly, slowly changing one's mind. It seems like such a powerful uh, engine to drive a story because it also is sort of like, isn't that, like what fiction is actually magically capable of doing is this like changing of the mind. And I, so I just experienced that so much in your story, but I like, but like the idea of memory being fallible also seems like very much true. <laughs> I have to say, I mean, I certainly was obsessed, I think. And I think I figured this out when I was halfway through writing just with folks I think we all have them in our life and perhaps we are one of them. I, you know, I, I it's something that I, I look out for myself. So Linda, when you're talking about what you're afraid of not remembering things, you know, certainly we all have these ticks from the older generation that we're perhaps a little more, you know, keen to and trying to dilute <laughs> as we get older. But just, I have seen people who are so intent on the way they remember things and that absolutely structures how they see themselves. And if that memory is proved to be false, it essentially just dissolves the entire foundation that they've built their life in on. And so I'm just so interested when that happens, how do people react? Because I think some people are, they take that fall, but they're able to like try and go back and accept it and rebuild it and just reform the structure that their life's built on. But I think some people just can't deal with it and either they just go on in denial or something catastrophic happens. But it's just endlessly fascinating to me, just the idea of the story that we tell ourselves about our lives and how we see ourselves and what happens when it's proven that it's not, it's not all on the up and up <laughs> and what you do then. And I love, you know, to, to echo what Jackie said about that uh, collective memory, uh, that sort of the the you know the the discussion and the revision of of what happens through what we think of as gossip and you know this kind of super structure and that super organism of memory is so interesting because they fight against the individual and the individual has to I think at there's some at some point Pramesh is kind of you know is thinking about what would they people remember about this moment and then he acts accordingly and that's so powerful and it's so interesting how that's already kind of you know shaping behavior the, the sort of the future memory of something by that collective is already shaping how he was going to conduct himself that day and um in, in, there's something so fraught and beautiful and interesting about that and you brought it out very wonderfully well, thank you so much. And I loved, again, love, love, love seeing it in, in all of our books handled in such different ways. Um, I think we have time to do one more round of questions from Linda and from Jackie, if we want to go ahead and do that. So I have, I'm trying to think, I have these two questions. I, I'll ask this one because um, it seems we're, so we all, this was all our first novel. Yeah. And what is it, like, how did the experience of publishing this, like, huge book and then getting a acclaim nomination for this prize among other things like how did the whole process of publishing your first novel surprise you in any way yeah linda you go first goodness um well <laughs> it's really hard to it's hard to answer because i i don't have anything to compare it with and but um i i, I have to say i uh, the, the the biggest wonderful surprise is actually having these kinds of conversations that I would never otherwise have um, before um, 
the novel was published. I mean, I, 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 I have writer friends, I had writer friends, but somehow these kinds of conversations was just not possible. And I think maybe there's something about having a, a, a tangible physical object <laughs> that you can talk about um, with other people that makes it happen. But um, that was definitely uh, a wonderful surprise. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> oh, I, I will echo that. One thing I never expected in any of this, this publishing journey, promotional journey was all these incredible connections that I would be able to make in these relationships. You know, there is no other possibility, I don't think, where I would have been able to meet you and, and you, Jackie, we're so, you know, far away from each other geographically. So just the fact that we we're all nominated from the prize and got to be in a room together and, you know, meet each other and feel that kinship, it wouldn't have happened in any other way. I don't, you know, I don't think. Um, for me, I mean, that that has been a lovely surprise and just the generosity of the writing community too, because I'm somebody who wasn't really participating in a writing community. I had a writing group of folks who I got um, the MFA program that I had gone to. So I, you know, who I kind of see occasionally, but otherwise I had kind of laid pretty low because this was a book I just kind of didn't want to share until it was already all done. So I wasn't really workshopping it or talking about writing it kind of doing that whole discussion without having anything I thought myself to prove felt like it was just anxiety ridden. So I just didn't talk about it, didn't participate in it, do, do any of that. So to then come out of that shell and just be greeted with such generosity from the writing community in terms of, you know, we all came out with books during the pandemic. So then we all had to do events virtually, which meant finding conversation partners and just me reaching out to people and cold reaching out to people and saying, you don't know me, but I think you might like my book. Do you want to do an event with me? And then having them say yes um, has just been just just such a, a lovely, lovely surprise and just tells you not only how, you know, the, the literary community can certainly be small in, in ways that are wonderful, but just how warm and giving it can be too. But I have to say the other big, big surprise associated with this book was the fact that it was published at all. Um, you, you know, just the fact that that happened because it was rejected by literally everybody who could reject a book in this country, in the UK, in Canada and in India, everybody rejected it. And then I happened to win the prize that my publisher puts out. And that's the only reason that it was published. So for me, when that happened, given the fact that it took so long to happen and it came at a point where I thought it was definitely never going to happen ever, it just made everything else just, it just, it just makes you, it just makes it wonderful, right? If you're never expecting it to happen to begin with, then anything you get after the fact is just, an, an extra cherry, I guess. It's so surprising to hear a story, that story about your book, because one time my sister, who's a painter, was telling me, like, I, this is long, before, I wasn't even working on this project yet, but she just said, you never hear about people's attempts that aren't successful. You assume that people are successful repeatedly, and that's all that happens to them, but it's all of this failure, and then there's these moments of success, which is what you see in the world. And that was helpful to hear, but I, but I still like, um, don't imagine that for other people other than myself. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. The book being published is far and away the biggest surprise to me. Um, and, and now I go back to feeling like, to like the before, I, I really do feel like going back to the before and like, um, I like, I like the working mindset of, um, this is my like private pursuit, or this is, this is with that, you know, not being, we'll never be judged. We'll never, maybe never be read, even though, yeah, I, yeah. So I'm, I kind of gladly return to that mindset of the obscure or something. <laughs> yeah. I've absolutely had the fantasy, very, very grateful and humbled by this whole experience, but I've had yeah. the fantasy of maybe I'll just write stuff and never share it with anybody. And then when I die, maybe like they'll find it and do whatever they want to do with it, but I'll be dead. So it won't matter. <laughs> but then you won't meet all these people. I know. I know. <laughs> Literally, the community is like the blessing. <laughs> I know. It really, really is.
Well, uh, should I ask another question? Yeah, should... why not? Okay. Yeah, I think we have time oh. for one more. Uh, well, uh, so so kind of going switching gears a little bit. Um, I you know when we were scheduling this conversation, it came out that all of us are night owls. <laughs> And I just want to add, you know, kind of going, you know, along with this idea of process and, you know, what, what do we do? How do we manage the rabbit holes and, and everything? How do you guys feel about, you know, uh, either going with the, the night owl kind of persona, your habits, your circadian rhythm, or having discipline or not, or, you know, doing what, you know, writing in the morning or what, I just, I'm just curious what you guys do kind of on a daily basis. Like how does a day in the life of uh, Jackie and Priyanka writing uh, look like? Yeah. Jackie, you should go first. Um, so I formerly identified as a night owl and still really do. I always, once I have two kids who are ages three and five. So there's like a little bit of an extra day that happens once they go to sleep. It's maybe three hours where I'm away. And it's, I just cherish that time so much. I try to do something writing related at some point in those three hours. But I also try to work in the morning when the kids go to daycare for a couple hours, like maybe three hours, they're gone, three or four. I try to commit that's my designated writing time. It makes me sound really disciplined, but I don't do it every day. And I'm like, don't do it well when I do it. But I still like, the, the goal is use the time that I'm paying to have <laughs> to do some writing. And then at night, it's like a bonus. And if I do it, um, it feels good. And it's, it, I don't know. I mean, I, I often like have other things to do during that time, but I definitely, revere those night hours as something that's like a freebie and kind of magical like low very low stakes so that other things are possible in the writing then yeah I've always been a night owl I just can't I'm not a morning person at all and I've also always um after graduate school I went straight into working full-time I have a nine-to-five office job it's not teaching um but so if I was going to write in the morning, I would have had to wake up at like four, five in order to get that done. And it's always sounded super appealing for my writing friends who do it because it's like you get up, you roll out of bed and you get your writing done. You're in that dream state still. So it's like, you know, this area of fecundity and, you know, everything's happening and, you know, then you're done for the day. Like you go to work and whatever, but the hard part of the day is done. Your writing is done. So you get to ride that satisfied high the whole day. I just can't do it. I just cannot wake up early for the life of me. Um, and so it just always happens. It just always happens at night. And it's also, um, it, it's got to happen when the house is quiet. There's nobody left in the house for me to talk to and distract myself with. Because I'm really good at just puttering around and, you know, just creating lots and lots of distractions for myself. So it's got to be when everybody else is asleep, the whole neighborhood is asleep, you know, the streets are quiet, it's dark. And I think it really is like just creating this atmosphere where it feels like nothing exists except for me. And then, you know, that notebook or that laptop screen in front of me where you can really kind of just like dive right into the page and get rid of that barrier. And also the need to sleep eventually is a really great motivator <laughs> because if you start at a certain time and you're like, well, I have to go to bed in two hours because I got to go to work tomorrow. Otherwise I'm going to be a zombie. Then it does, it does like force you to write something. But the downside is like that satisfied high that you get when you actually feel like you were productive. I only have it until I go to bed. And then when, you know, the clock starts right up again when I wake up in the morning and I just can't, I can't keep that high going. So it's just like this constant, it feels like a very masochistic cycle where I can never, you know, enjoy whatever I did the night before because it's so short lived before going to bed, but I can't, I just can't do it any other way. Um, I've tried and I don't know. I think, you know, just like the fact that I don't write outlines and it's very organic discovering the story. Um, I've, I came to peace with that a very long time ago. That that's how I was going to be. What about you, Linda? 
So, so this is a selfish, this was a selfish question because I'm constantly trying to figure this out. And so just to amend my previous answer about the, the surprise post publication is that another surprise is that people ask us questions like, how do you work? And <laughs> what is your process? As if, like, I know. <laughs> So, and, and I, you know, and, but then now I feel like I've, um, I've done something where I should have learned from it. And, and yet I still don't really know <laughs> what I learned from the process. Um, and so for me, the, the, the irony is that I'm a night person and my energy is high and, and you know, after dark, uh, but then it, it, there's a weird thing where in the morning, I'm also more optimistic than I am <laughs> at night so then the sweet spot of having optimism and energy is is definitely not late at night for me like I, I could be very you know energetic and and thinking about all sorts of things but then I think oh you know <laughs> there are all these reasons for me not to do it yeah. to not not do this really difficult thing so um I don't know I'm still trying different combinations but well, when you talk about th this is so interesting, Linda, with this like sweet spot and also the optimism, because often what will happen to me is I'm, I'm writing late at night um, and I'll write something where I'm like, oh, my God, this is brilliant. This solves everything. And then I wake up in the next morning and I read it and I'm like, oh, goodness, we're not we can't keep that. Nobody must ever see that ever, ever again. And I'm wondering, do you all do you all think like, does that happen to morning people too? Does it like, is this like a common problem for everybody, no matter what time of day you're writing in? It sounds common to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, it's like the Seinfeld episode where Jerry's like half asleep and he writes down in the notebook and he has no idea what he wrote. It's it's very much one of those things. I do sometimes at night I'll wake up like when I'm kind of half asleep. Um, something will come and I'll either, I, I used to write it down, but now I text it to myself or I do it in the notes app. And then again, in the morning, it's eagerly looking, what was it? And either being like, well, what was that? <laughs> or, 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 oh, okay, maybe I might be able to do something with that. Well, I sometimes have like very literary dreams where I think, gosh, if I could do this while I'm awake, then I'm all set. Right. But unfortunately, it doesn't quite cross over. So or where you write the whole book or the whole story in your dream, you were and then like well, I would have dreams where I'm writing poems and I can almost I can see it like in the in the air. And I think, oh, that's brilliant. I just have to like transcribe it now. And then of course I wake up and I think. Hmm. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> so it's, and it's gone. It's all gone. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, well, I think we're up on our time, which is actually devastating to me because I have so enjoyed this conversation with the two of you. And you know, seeing you virtually after seeing you in person for so long. Thank you so much for doing this with me. And even more importantly, thank you for sharing your books with us and with the audience out there um, and everybody at 1455. I know I speak for both of you when I say we wanna thank the 1455 community and especially the executive director, Sean Murphy for having us and everybody out there, thank you for watching and definitely make sure to try and support 1455 because they put out some wonderful, wonderful literary programming, um, which is all or mostly free from what I understand. Um, so Linda and Jackie, thank you again for being here and for this conversation. Thank you so much for bringing us together, Priyanka. <laughs> it's been Bye. wonderful. All right. We're definitely going to have to keep in touch. We might have to make this a yearly thing. Even if we don't have books come out, we'll just do a Zoom reunion every year. <laughs> Once every decade yeah. when the books come out. <laughs> yes, we should. That's much more apt. <laughs> we can have a collective launch party every decade. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good deadline. All right. Have a great evening. You too. Thank you, Thank you so much. Good night night.